Hello, everyone. It's great to see you guys joining early. Stay tuned. We'll be starting shortly.
So hi guys, hello everyone. Welcome to another session of the Data Hour series. We'll be starting in five minutes. Till then, let's get to know each other in the chat section. Also, we'll be launching a poll about your location and experience. Kindly answer the questions in the poll. Hello. I'm audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. All right. Yeah. Hello, Serene from Portugal. It's great to see you. I can see people from Bangalore, Austin. Good. Chennai. I've launched a poll, guys. Please do fill in. I can see people from child Tunisia, Tunisia. Sorry if I'm spelling out wrong, pronouncing wrong. Varun, hello Varun. Hi Manshi. Hi Ravi. Hope you guys have answered the poll. Please do fill in the poll. We'll kickstart the session soon.
Okay, hello and welcome everyone to another session in the Dataverse series. We are thrilled to be here with you this evening for a session full of action-packed learning. I am Tamil Selvan Murugeshan, part of the data science team at Analytics Vidya. And I'll be the moderator for this session along with Mr. Ram Goswami, Ms. Raksha and Mr. Shrest. For those who have joined us for the first time, let me give you a brief introduction about what is Dataverse sessions. Okay, the data the data hour is a series of webinars conducted by Analytics Vidya and led by top industry experts. It is a fun way to understand the concepts of data science from the leading players in the data tech domain. And as the name suggests, it's one hour dedicated to data. We are hopeful that these sessions are going to be a great source of enrichment and value adding for our community members. So now on to our session today, which is bias and fairness in national la natural language processing. So this data hour will cover the background of how biases can occur in natural language processing systems and why it is important to identify them. The session will also include techniques to identify and mitigate these biases and also how to estimate the fairness. I hope you are excited to attend this data hour with us. So before we kick things off and I hand it over to our speaker, a quick recap of, of the housekeeping items. We are recording this session and we'll make the recording available in a few, uh, few days on our YouTube channel. Please use the question and answer section for asking any questions you might have during the session and we'll do our best to answer them towards the end of the session. Also, we share a poll about the feedback of the session towards the end of the session, which I request you to kindly fill up. So now on to our speaker. In this session, we have Mr. Santam Sakshina with us. So about Mr. Santam, he currently works at McKenzie and Company and has an experience of more than five years and works mostly around natural language processing and related problems. He is currently pursuing masters in AI and from IIT Jodhpur and will be starting his research on graph neural networks. Mr. Santam also likes to write poems when he gets time and is currently exploring the realm of photography, mainly street style. So over to you, sir. The virtual stage is all yours. Awesome. Hey everyone, good evening. For if you're based out of India and uh, good afternoon, probably for the people in European and American region. So. Um, yeah, I'll quickly uh, share my screen so that we can actually get started. Mm, okay. Just give me a cue when you are able to see my screen, right? Your screen is visible, sir. You are good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, so let's get started. So our conversation for today is mostly around how we can estimate bias and and understand fairness in the context of NLB systems. And uh, to get started with, I'll quickly go through the contents. The contents are first I'll introduce to the topic and uh, understand what bias is and what discrimination is all about. Then we'll move for uh, to understand how biases occur in the in instruments of machine learning. For example, we have so machine learning pipelines have data, model, and inference as the processes, right? So we have biases in data, model, and inferences. Now, backbones of NLP systems has been around word embeddings. So we'll start to understand what biases are there in the word embeddings, how to identify them, how to debias those word embeddings, how to do bias mitigation. And then we'll spend some time around how to evaluate biases. And then a short, disc uh, short discussion around what large language models are. And uh, uh, to get started, um, I, I am expecting that everyone is at least understands the concept of what ML systems are. I'm not, I don't want anyone to know the algorithm side of it, but still, again, you know, a brief introduction uh, to it is important. Your familiarity is good to have. And uh, what NLP does is NLP is natural language processing. So anything related to text predictions or tokenization, whatever it is, comes into the realm of natural language processing. And uh, all right, then let's get started. Um, so the first question, you know, I would ask to everyone, you know, are you a discriminatory person or just biased? And that's a very peculiar thing to even ask anyone understand because everyone has some sort of bias. All right. And uh, you cannot avoid that, but acting on that bias is what, you know, creates discrimination, creates divide, and that's where the problem starts. So first let's try to understand conceptually and logically what biases are and what discrimination is so that we know what we are solving for. Right. Um, so the next slide would be, yeah. So first thing we have to understand what biases. 
so bias is is an inclination or you know or tendency for for one person or group which is again in a negative connotation which deems unfair to people right and discrimination is again when you are a biased person and when you start acting on your biases that's where the discrimination starts so you know the whole idea of in the social construct and even in nlp in, in machine learning also is we want to prevent discrimination that comes with bias but first we have to eliminate the bias so that there is no scope of discrimination so to move ahead you know i'll just ask everyone to do a quick google search on google images just ask uh, search bodybuilder in google images and i'll wait for like 10 15 seconds for everyone to you know go through it and uh, would like to you know uh, see the reactions of what is happening right all right so if you if you actually search bodybuilder in google images i'm sure you'll see a lot of jacked men uh, you know posing for with their you know all the muscles they have you know and uh, all the you know the shiny muscles they have so essentially what i am trying to point out here is bodybuilder is a gender neutral term right and when, and when we do search anything on uh, say youtube or google search we why do we get only male responses there and you know that's discouraging because if someone if we, if i consider myself as a maybe if i am a female person and i want to do bodybuilding and if i search google that how to build, be a bodybuilder then i'll not get those responses which encourages me to pursue that thing maybe i'll think that okay bodybuilding is just for male people and that's where you know the, because of the bias in the model there is this discrimination happening to to the new people so similarly if you search in google images if you search nurses you'll see a lot of women there if you say search homemaker you'll see a lot of women there which is again a bias it's not necessary homemakers can be men too it's a gender neutral term but still we feel, we find those things and that is what the essence of bias is in the big machine learning paradigm if you see in your day to day lives in your pro in the flagship products of company and stuff like that so first to start with um we have in in our any machine learning pipeline it starts with data so first we identify what types of biases are there in the data already so now these four or five categories are exhaustive but these are not technical in nature right so these are categorizations which comes from research papers and individual researches but it, it is not a formal thing but again the first one would be um selection bias where you know the data selection does not actually reflect a random sample example english language data does not represent every dialect of english so the people who use different dialects of english are not at all represented in the data altogether because you never selected those data and adding to that example if you search wikipedia wikipedia pages over represent men just because articles are more about men and articles written by men are there more so this is called selection bias and the next one is out group homogeneity bias so what this means is people tend to see the out group people as more alike than in group people so in a nutshell what it means is you see the world this, the way you see yourself so for example now um for example researchers are consistently incorrectly treating non binary as a single cohesive gender which is actually not true right and that's where the representation of those communities and those people are not there and the systems do not have any information about that and systems do predict according to what they have learned so this bias comes from you know just how you treat your data altogether now skewed sampling on your feedback loop so let me explain how this works so when you have an nlp system or a machine learning system and you have built a model on top of your data and you get a new data and you give your predictions assuming that you have already a biased model and you give predictions based on your previous biases now after this say 6 months you want you want to upgrade your data you want to update your data and for that you will again come back to your own predictions which you seen you found correct now the biased outputs are again fed into the system and the model is retrained again on that same very biased set to become probably a more biased model so just because a skewed sampling or you know a um, minority class and representation was not there when we were trained the model so the model by its nature 
started with that only and it's still a biased system <clears throat> the fourth category is um limited features so in limited features what happens is um you try to collect data for say indigenous communities across uh, across nations for example but you find you know that there are a lot of communities there in the amazon but you could not collect the relevant data or maybe the team you sent could not collect the data there so now there is this no, no representation of some of the indigenous communities which had characteristics of their own which differentiates them from the others but because they were not even accounted in the data so they don't have any information about that right and so this is one of so because of the limited features the models over generalize they don't know anything about this and you know things go on the fifth final category is proxies now i'll explain what proxies are so proxies is essentially if you even so for example if your model is sexist in nature you want your so one fix that you want could be just remove gender from the equation altogether right just remove the gender feature altogether from the data what if your pin code or your demographic data is strongly correlated to the gender or even the race so now what happens is although the gender bias is not there in your system but gender bias is acting as a proxy feature in your in your machine learning system as a as a data input and the intended purpose of debiasing the debiasing your data is not there so you're still getting biased output so for example um in the policing systems it's very common to hear that uh, wrongly accused people are getting arrested and you know questioned and all those things this happens just because uh, they rely more on the demographics data rather than other attributes and those overpower them and you get such kind of you know um, irresponsible and sad results next um we should discuss about biases in models so now that we have covered data now let's discuss what biases and models can mean so first is algorithmic prejudice now it's a very fancy word but an uh, uh, it's just describing the effects of proxies on the models so algorithmic prejudice occurs when there is a statistical dependence between the protected features now protected features are race example i'm giving an example as race a gender and the pin codes and other informations which are used to make a decision even if we remove the gender bias from one of the law enforcing or police agencies which are the example which i was giving earlier that can actually lead the agencies moving on with their unjust practices because of the social attributes of the individual can actually lead the agency in doing wrong things which are not legal in nature or not even acceptable in society right the next type of more uh, biases and model is negative legacy and uh, negative legacy refers to the bias already present in the data used to train the model so in general the so for example if you say um if you have only like four features to predict a uh, outcome and one of the feature is in social attribute which should not be there then you are training on a bias set by design not by accident so negative legacy is because the your legacy data on which your model has been trained has been biased so your model is biased now and it will work the way it was trained um the next uh, the third one is again it's underestimation so underestimation occurs when there is not enough data for the model to make confident conclusions for some segment of the population the bias in the data then leads to biased behavior in the ai model so again this ties back to again not able to have the right proportion or light composition of data uh fed to the ml system and if you don't feed the data right the model will again comes out to be crappy and you know, not usable and if it, and if you're not aware of its crappiness then you're using it for your own good and later it backfires uh, and uh, uh things go wrong um so the last one uh, in the ml system uh, the categorization of biases is biases in interpretation and that's where the discrimination takes place which i was talking earlier right so already you had bias and now you have started to act on it right so the first is confirmation bias now confirmation bias is the tendency to search for interpret favor recall information in a way that confirms pre existing beliefs that is a company mistrues 
it's automated resume screening systems right so for example if you have an automated resume screening system say for a big company which and you get a lot of uh, applications for you know for various profiles and jobs now you cannot do manually that's why you have an ai system now the ai system does is it uses your demographic data and all those things and uh, with which time you realize uh, that the female candidates or candidates from the minority groups are not even getting shortlisted uh, for the screening rounds because the model learned altogether that generally women coming from this and that area of the country part of the country are not really good for our company you know qualified for the company and that's wrong you cannot judge a person like that but still the ai system do does that so this in this you know fault in engineering altogether is called over generalization uh sorry it's confirmation bias and uh you know uh it's uh, it's very discriminatory in nature if uh, used very wrongly and the second one is over generalization so coming to conclusions based on information that is too general like researchers conclude that facial recognition model works like 99.8 percent accuracy uh, everyone based on its overall accuracy on data that contains only white men and only white people then people of different of other colors are not getting you know identified and when they get identified they are an outlier and when they are an outlier uh the law enforcing agency the police don't trust them and then they are sent for questioning and all those things happen so over generalization happens to a lot of models because it is trained on such data and the third one is correlation fallacy so correlation is something so there is this distinction distinction between correlation and causation now we we can surely say that one feature is correlated to other but it's very hard to say that one feature leads to is a, is a con, so the uh, one feature is the cause of the next feature and because there is correlation there you can identify but if it, there is causation there then it's hard to identify and fourth one is automation bias so automation bias is you know we just trust the system more like the automated system more and when even when there are checks present we, there is an overlook oversight and we are not able to catch those mistakes so propensity for humans to favor suggestions from an automated decision making system over contradictory information without any automation right tendency of people to trust automation more is something uh, which creates a disbalance between uh, trust and accountability and uh, rather than has rather than a sound sense of judgment we are getting uh, to the point where we are doing you know bad judgments and uh, bad outcomes so right um so biases in interpretation truly necessitate the creation and usage of metrics that can uncover fair unfairness and bias association in models and that's a very important thing to uh, have in a ml system that even if you have a model there should be monitoring there in in engineering aspect and also in the qualitative aspect um so um um yeah, am i audible yes sir you are audible you are audible okay all right um i'm trying to change my slide okay so now um now that as we go further we'll be using some terms specific to nlp and let me quickly and in the most simplified way explain what word embeddings are as we can see in the image if you are able to represent a word in a vector because let's face it computers don't understand numbers uh, computers only understand i'm so sorry computers only understand numbers but not text but the numbers are contextually relevant that is if the dimensions i have meanings such as living thing philin human gender royalty verb plural so these are dimensions on which the word cat has been evaluated and all these number represent uh, the degree of sim of association of the word cat to all these dimensions so this figure simplifies the number of dimensions of the embeddings but generally we have a lot more of them common numbers are 50 100 and 300 etc and these word embeddings are generated using neural networks and those algorithms we will not be discussing right now but in a in a general way every word can now be represent, represented in a vector in a form of a vector and to visualize that we can uh, use a dimensionality reduction technique to uh, convert the n dimensional embedding to say two dimension and actually can see in the image here that uh, 
cat is close to kitten but dog is very far away from the house right so we can see similar words are grouped together because they have similar features and when projected they assume the same direction and yeah please keep this concept in mind because when we discuss the measures to remove the bias from the embeddings this formulation and this whole concept will be appearing again and again um so let's start with uh, biases in word embeddings so now that we have a system where we are able to define a word in an embedding uh in an embedding which is a vector that's where the biases are those numbers are where the biases are and uh, we'll now understand what biases in word embedding means i'll quickly pause for a second and see in the chat if there are questions all right so we can actually move ahead um cool uh, so embedding spin point the implicit sexism in test right and uh, so we are not new to this we understand how these things are structured and to to go back to our roots how our word embeddings generated it uses text so now we need a lot of text to actually understand what a word means contextually and how it how it happens with co-occurrence and all those things so for example the uh, word embedding is trained on wikipedia data set right and the reddit questions and twitter and all those things now we understand where this data comes from and how people can and are manipulating the data in their own way and if we train a model to learn embeddings we'll get all the biases we have as humans because humans are actually putting stuff on the internet right so this was actually researched by tolga bulwaski and his friends and they observed that if you subtract the embeddings of man and woman they are almost equal to the difference of king and queen which is intuitive because the direction of the embedding vector of man minus woman and king queen should be parallel to each other but the surprising thing was when the same thing happened with programming and homemaker so in the bottom left of the uh, bottom right of the slide i have mentioned the paper which which i have taken that example and the whole research and because king and queen associate themselves to man and woman respectively and that's fine but what they also observed that the same difference is present for programmer and homemaker which is absurd which is definitely not true and these are actually gender neutral terms again we discussed earlier so what we can do to improve this undesirable situation and that's what uh, the next section of our conversation lies so we'll be discussing more around how to debias word embeddings um so let us quickly try to formulate um the solution so the box here is an axis of embedding space so i have assumed that we are able to visualize this embedding on a 2d space although we have a lot more dimensions but for the sake of understanding and easing my pain of doing all the linear algebra let's keep it to two dimensions and we can as discussed earlier we can see that the doctor and nurse and man woman difference vectors are parallel to each other right so as we already know the direction of similar words in the embedding space here for simplification uh let us consider a gender axis which is parallel to doctor nurse and man woman axis it is fair to say and it's very intuitive to understand that any values perpendicular to the gender axis should not have any gender related information and that's where our, our biggest clue lies so again let us point this vectors and and now we have a neutral axis and now we will project the doctor nurse man and woman vectors onto the neutral axis i uh, will not go to the algebra of it uh, but if you are able to project nurse and doctor on the vertical axis which is perpendicular to the gender axis we will not have information about about gender there so and hence now we can safely say that now a doctor can be anything because we don't have any component of um gender anymore but again i'll wait for a good question right now how did you get the gender axis because you are say you guys you can ask that shantam you are saying that okay you say uh, man and woman and king and queen are parallel to each other but how did you get the gender axis to get the gender axis you know one of the easier way would be to average out the sum of pairs of um of 
different words for example man and woman and king and queen if you take the difference of one set and create and take a few of them and just do an average of it now you have a uh, and you have now a subspace a gender axis to start working with now although we did go through a small case study of how to debias a word embedding which was a simplified case for ease of understanding but now we'll go in detail for a few types of debiasing techniques it's a fairly technical conversation but i'll do my best to make it as simple as possible to do debias any word embedding it's a two step process first we have to identify a concept subspace now what is a concept subspace um so it's again a fancy word of gender axis right so gender axis is a concept subspace in a way that concept is the gender is now the concept and subspace is the axis from which we want to create a per, uh, axis perpendicular to it which is our neutral axis where we want to project our vectors there and uh, so let's get started with the techniques for it um so you know um since we were already discussing about direction of vectors so it was time that you know we will encounter something related to pc at least so pca uh, which is principal component analysis used for dimensionality reduction it's highly directional in nature so the most general and simple approach to determine a subspace sub subspace is done by using pca now in this example if you see in the image every dot women man she he and sister everyone is green so in this we take one set of all the words and refer to as seed words now this seed is now on this seed we apply pca and compute the top principal component which is the best one dimensional subspace that minimizes the sum of squares distances from all the word vectors this resulting unit vector represents the subspace direction now now that we have a subspace direction now we can project women man everything on the on the neutral axis which is again perpendicular to the gender axis so now that we can think of you, you know we are using pca for you know all the words what if we use that for pairs for example man and woman he and she brother and sister so the next algorithm or next method to actually get the sub feature subspace is paired pca same thing you just do you know you take differences of those two words like she and he and then compute the pca all right but again uh, one thing to note here is because we are already uh, doing a differences here so in pca we don't need to center the center around the mean which is an assumption for pca right so we will not be needing to do that the next most common method um is the two means method um so here we can see two sets of words right the orange ones which are the female ones and the uh, green one which are the male ones so we'll take two sets of words as seed sets say m and f and and what it does is we want the two means method to return the normalized difference vector of the respected averages so for example for for females what we'll do is we'll average out the embedding for males and embedding embedding for females and then take a difference from them so what i discussed like four or five slides before is what doing it's what we are doing here for the differences we just take a mean of it and we get a gender or a concept subspace where again we can you know do all side sorts of projections so we so here the gender axis is again the black one and the red one is the concept subspace and uh, now that we can use pca and all those things we can actually now actually use a model to actually get the gender axis so for two group of seed words that can be classified if we have two group of seed words then we can use svm which creates a decision boundary and and if we have a decision boundary using pca we can actually get a line perpendicular decision boundary which is again the concept boundary concept uh, direction so the direction perpendicular to the classification boundary represents the direction of difference between the two sets again this only requires two sets like males and females but they do not need to be paired or equal in size the other methods require them to be equal in size but there it is we don't need that this is shown in the figure where the dotted line you the line vertical in our in our screens 
is the classification boundary between you know the set women sister and she and males uh, men brother and he the black segment coming out from the uh, classification axis indicates the gender direction and we can use also use this direction iteratively to remove bias and word vectors by projections i hope until then you are following and that's a good thing and now let's go to the next session which will be bias mitigation so in bias mitigation we we'll now that we have a concept of space the next thing would be to project the project or word embeddings on the subspace to start uh, to get uh, to to debias or word embeddings um so the first technique we'll be discussing is linear projection so linear projection is the simplest of all um it uses only two sets seed states call m and f we have man he and woman she and in the example you can see that the gender neutral terms are purple in color um orange one are the female ones and green are the men ones so in first step step 0 both the seed sets are evaluated and viewed from the perspective of pca where the gender direction is identified using two means so first we'll identify the gender direction the, the black line there using two means and then in step 1 the viewing perspective is reoriented so the gender direction is aligned with the x axis where we clearly see that the receptionist and nurse are now shown to be closer towards the female direction while banker and engineer now are closer towards the male direction so in the next step step 2 for every word in the embedding linear projection removes its component along the gender direction but all the words are shown to be aligned uh, aligned on the horizontal axis the underlying data is modified in this step so your embeddings get modified permanently and in the last step the transformed the debias points are reoriented again using the perspective from pca where there is no clear gender association among the occupational words so in the last option you can see that the gender neutral terms are grouped together and man and women and all things are very sparsely distributed the next technique uh, we'll be talking about is hard devising so it's sp specifically designed for gender bias not particularly used as of now we are we have now better techniques to deal with it but as a concept it's a very uh, fundamental uh, technique so we need two seed sets called say men and f m and f again the same thing and we'll need an equalized set called boy girl and sister brother and one evaluation set which has gender neutral terms so in the first step is again obtained after reorientation reorientation of the gender direction using the along the x axis using the two means method in the next step we remove the component of each point along the gender direction with the exception of may m and f so the males and females except from the males and females we remove every other component which has gender around it now in step th step 3 we try to preserve some information regarding gender using the equalized set thus extending the words in q q is the equalized set right and then along the gender direction so that they become equally far apart so we want to cap we want to maintain the gender aspect for at least for me uh, male and uh, men and women but we want to remove that for banker and engineer and receptionist and nurse because these are gender neutral and neutral terms in the earlier techniques what we were doing was we were removing gen gender as an as as an as a feature from all the embeddings but here we want to keep that for uh, man and woman but to move that from everyone else now in step 4 um again reorient the modified words using pca from a viewing perspective and the direction of pca is where the maximum variance occurs one concern because we are still keeping the gender aspect preserved or maintain we have we may have a uh, res uh, leave residues there residual bias there and it and there is this chance that we you know do not remove at all so that's why it's you know not in use anymore but it's a very good concept to understand and again we can always build a model on top over it and uh, because uh, why not do that iteratively so in the iterative null space projection which is the last method we will discussing right now it starts with a pair of large word list 
like sets of males and females words say 1000 1000 words it suggests to take the top 0.5% of the extreme words along either directions of the he she vector denoted as sets m and f respectively it then builds a linear classifier that best separates m and f fair and then linearly projects all words along the classifier normal again same thing happening previously also however a classifier with accuracy better than random may still be built on the m and f sets so the inlp then applies linear projection to all the words again and this continues for some large number of iterations and once you start to see no improvement then uh, we stop this iteration a perfect separator classifier can be found initially in step 1 and then linear projection along the classifier normal is shown in step 2 the next classifier more normal shown in step 4 is not a perfect separator yet after its next application and a pc orientation in, as shown in figure 6 the step 6 the the connotation in the occupations are rectified so there is no sufficiently good classifier if there is no sufficiently good classifier can be found after this the procedure stops i hope you are with me right now so one question here is by pyl saying in 2d what are the x and y axes so in like in n dimensional space you have n axes right so if you do a pca and uh, take two dimensions only these two dimensions are the components which have maximum variance and which come and which has the maximum contribution of variance so for example if you remember what pca does what it does is it gives you components which when added up give you the maximum variance and you can remove the rest of them so that these two components are the best components which capture the maximum variance say 50% 70 80 90% whatever and that is these are the two axes it's for visualization purposes because we cannot visualize anything beyond three dimensions right and other questions is how can we find magnitude all right so keep these questions for the end now let's focus our discussion around um, bias evaluation and uh, now that we have identified bias we have fixed bias now we'll have to see how our data set is biased if it's biased then how much and after correction how much we have improved so we need a metric to see how we can quanti quantitatively evaluate our debiasing process or even the data quality for that matter so the first technique we'll be discussing is a word embedding association test wit so it checks for human like biases associated with words in word embeddings for example it found career oriented words executive and career are more associated with statistically male names like tom and peter and male gendered word example men and boy while family oriented words like family home are more associated with statistically female names like mary and kate and female gendered words like women and girl now wheat considers four set of words two darket words sets x and y example representing male and female genders and and uh, two sets of attribute words a and b which represent stereotypical male and female professions now if you see the formula here for every target word w in a and b it computes how much the word is associated with set a and not with set b so the s of w a and b is you know the mean of the cosine similarity some mean of the cosine similarity of the wor of words in set a mi minus the mean of cosine similarity of the words in set b and where this cos a of w which you can see is the cosine similarity between vectors a and w then it averages this across all w minus the average of uh, in all w in y then finally the wheat test statistic s of x y and b is normalized by the standard deviation of the subspaces seen to retain and uh, we want to retain the orthogonal orthogonal nature and the 
it's a standard deviation so with using standard deviation we normalize it standardize it and so the typical values of uh, the wheat metric wheat statistic ranges from minus 1 to 1 any value close to 0 is a good good value for us where we can see that the bias is not really there the positive and negative directions are skewed in nature um the other tests okay so there are two other tests which we will not discussing right now because in because of the time constraints but one is embedding coherence test and the next is nli based test so the embedding coherence test measures if group of words have stereotypical association in in a way which uses spearman coefficient uh, to calculate correlation so the spearman coefficient measures the similarity of list of attributes embeddings sorted based on the similarity to the target embeddings now again this also ranges from minus 1 to 1 with values closer to 1 indicating less biased association and for the nli, NLI based tests since word representations are used downstream in different tasks and applications in nlp it is important to measure the effect biased associations have on the decisions made on these tasks this is where nli based tests come into picture the task is given a pair of sentences to predict if the second one is entailed contradicted or neutral to the first sentence now entailment and contradictions are you know in terms of in computer science or in ai it's a bit different it's a bit nuanced so i'll probably recommend you to spend some time and you know understand a little bit because it's a, it's a bit complicated and a little detailed in nature and but you know equally interesting so go have a shot at it um all right so to recap we started with understanding what um what biases are what kind of biases are how to identify how to fix those biases how to you know and technically represent biases and how to evaluate how your uh, debiasing techniques have worked now let's discuss about uh, the elephant in the room and uh, apart from the bad joke and you know a very cute picture of an elephant let's start a discussion around the next thing language models uh, because language models are the crux of the core of the NLP engineering and NLP pipelines, which are deployed in production right now. So language model refers to systems which are trained on string, string prediction tasks. So either you want to predict the next word, a next set of words, or just complete a paragraph. So the applications has been around, you know, text input systems, you know, it's heavily relying on speech recognition, machine translation, spelling correction, and all those things. And language models have been built on conventionally on RNN based, not anymore, but yeah, a good concept. An upgrade to RNN was LSTM. So we have language models which have which are LSTM based. And the last one is transformer based, which is the most exciting one because that's where the interest of the industry and research is. And a work has been a lot of work has been done and is being done on transformer based models. To understand um what the history of language models is specifically large language models let's trace back to year 2018 like three and a half four years before the elmo model had 94 million parameters now what parameters here are if anyone is aware of deep learning and if not i'll just quickly summarize that parameters are essentially how many features are you learning and then deep learning the bigger the model the more the parameter the model learns and uh, the comp the more complex the model is so if you can see by the year 2020 the t5 model had 11 billion parameters and the gpt3 had massive 175 billion parameters but the crazy thing is megatron turing energy which is like the state of the art latest one has 530 billion parameters and to give you some perspective human mind has approximately 88 billion neurons so it's up to you to decide if it's an overkill or not right and the newest gpt4 which is which we are anticipating is expected to have 100 trillion parameters like crazy numbers although this looks exciting and interesting and it's arguably fair to say that um larger the model better it is on the natural language tasks but there are a downside to it uh, first of all the issues of bias and its complications persist. Next, the carbon footprint is exceptionally high. So it is reported that the GPT-3 model development 
took approximately 100 million dollars to complete and that's a crazy big number for any use case to crack also you might have heard about the dal e the latest transformer based model which can create amazing synthetic pictures by just a small description so naturally i was curious and i had a session to take and we already talked about jacked bodybuilders so here it is so if i search if i want to generate an image of a bodybuilder dancing i get nine reference images everyone is a male although we can debate about the quality that's a whole different thing because i'm using a dal e mini prototype here not the dial, dial e full but the issue still is, this, is still there um all the bodybuilders are male and uh, it's up to you to decide if they're dancing or not but they still have some poses there all right and uh, even after you know this is the even in the latest models we are still able to find these biases and salt and these things are still at our disposal so you know we are doing research on this we are working on this but still we are getting these issues because um yeah um so again these are all references from the uh, paper the paper is linked in the ppt if i share the ppt you'll get the paper also um the, so the analysis on the words in the 175 billion parameters model for gpt is this um so the average number of co-occurrences co across all words and um all right so if you see the males and females columns for me and for the most of the people and even as far as law is concerned every word can be associated to both of them except the word maybe pregnant right but every other word can be associated to any gender but we see here as you know the males are being characterized as eccentric jolly stable for some reason and lazy and uh, females are given optimistic bubbly and beautiful and again you know these are the biases in the model altogether and we are able to identify them so let us take some time here we have a great language model gpt3 and it works like magic on many of the use cases which are advertised right but there's a big but and the conversation i want to have is to understand the use cases when we talk about ai a lot of focus is generally on the intelligence side of things and in our own experience we dismiss people we cancel politicians celebrities who are intelligent of course but very discriminatory if we have such high standards for individuals we sure should have some standards for the ai that is being, that is shaping our lives daily and the applications where these large language models gets the extra push of performance can actually be those where it can be seriously biased we can see here that's just the worst kind of bias we can observe as far as genders are concerned and these are just co-occurrences and raw not contextual ones so let's go and see another example from the same paper now now let's look past gender and see how religions are getting encoded in the gpt3 model more and more bad news it's important to understand the limitations of language models and we really need to put their success in context this not only helps in reducing the hype which we can which can mislead the public and researchers themselves regarding the capabilities of these language models <clears throat> but might encourage new research directions that do not necessarily depend on having larger language models focusing on the state of the art results on leaderboards without encouraging deeper understanding of the mechanisms by which they are achieved can cause misleading results as shown and direct resources away from efforts that would facilitate the long term progress towards natural language understanding without using unfathomable training data the internet is large and diverse virtual space and accordingly it is easy to imagine that very large data sets such as the common crawl one which is essentially used as a, pa a part of common crawl 11 is used for the gpt training must therefore be broadly representative uh, for the in which different people view the world and the you know the next example you know that's the the, the worst one in all cases um the voices of people most likely to have a hegemonic viewpoint a very biased viewpoint are also the most likely to be retained in the case of us and uk english this means that white supremacist and misogynistic ages this is all kind of views are over represented in the training data not only exceeding the prevalence in general population but also setting up models trained on these data sets to further amplify these biases and harms for example, GPT-2's training data is sourced from scrapes, scraping out 
links from reddit and uh, wikipedia and the internet and pew internet research survey reveals that 67% of reddit users in the us are men and 29% of them are between ages 18 and 22 similarly recent surveys of wikipedians found that only 8.8 to 15% data is around women uh, or girls furthermore while user generated contents like reddit twitter and wikipedia present themselves as open and accessible to anyone there are structural factors including moderation practices which makes them less welcoming to marginalized communities the net result is that a limited set of sub population can continue to easily add data sharing their thoughts and developing platforms that are inclusive of their world views this systematic pattern in turn worsens diversity and inclusion within internet based communication creating a feedback loop that lessens the impact of data from under represented populations so i'll be still here in this slide because this is the most disturbing piece of information i saw in my research on this topic and i'll be here talking about everything with a focus on this site especially maybe all this co2 is worth there for there is no doubt that the performance of the big language models is impressive language generators and machine translation systems have based on these systems produced text that looks a lot like produced by a person but is this a good thing human communication is oriented towards making sense of what others are saying and writing and so we have a strong tendency to find coherence and meaning even when they aren't there in the case of text produced by a language model they aren't there a language model knows nothing more than probabilistic information about sequences of words in the corpus it was trained on there is no communicative goal no genuine meaning at all meaning at all behind the text it produces it's just a stochastic parrot so now the word so stochastic parrot is a, is a curious word because this was given by timnath gibru she was a um google employee before uh, she was um uh, let go by the google after her paper on the fairness of uh, language models in the wrong hands it could be truly dangerous for example we could produce huge quantities of seemingly coherent text on a given topic making it appear that there is a great interest in public and discussing it or we would could generate countless of pages of comments and you know appre appreciations on an instance of fake news refining the information and effectively render rendering it a social reality what if i just create a um, you know big comment page you know after this session saying that okay this presentation was amazing i love this presentation i get like 70 80 100 comments praising my great work in this presentation which was actually not there but i can do that and create an impression in linkedin probably saying that okay i'm a very famous personality altogether which is which is wrong which is far away from the social reality in which i am um so what next um we are still doing research and trying to formalize a way in which models can be more accountable and reliable in their quest for the best performance there is also there is great focus on data driven ai and improving the quality of data we use for these tasks now timnath gibru actually provided a new idea which is data sheets for data sets so in electronics industry every component no matter how simple or complex is accompanied with a data sheet describing its operating characteristics test results recommended uses and other information by analogy we propose that uh, we uh, by analogy proposal is that the collection process uh, that every data set should be accompanied with a data sheet that documents its motivation composition collection process recommended uses and so on and we are starting to see it see it if you go for the hugging face uh, gpt models there is guidelines and there are examples saying that what the model can be used for and what it should not be used for and that's a good step around this direction because i remember when i was doing my graduation i was an electronics student and when i used to do any sorts of robotics work and i used to get those lcds and microcontrollers and processors i had to refer to the data data sheets for or for all these components because that's where the specifications are that's where the usage is that's where the the guidelines are so that i don't know do not mess up my work so yeah i think that's pretty much it i'm um, i think there is a lot of thought going around how to mitigate bias how to understand what bias is and how minimizing bias is essentially increasing fairness and so i'll stop here and for ask uh, for some q and a
and uh, yeah let's Hi, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there uh-huh. uh, so before we proceed to answer the question and answers uh, i would like to shoot a poll and i request all the audience to participate in the poll please all right please do participate in the feedback poll as it would help us to conduct more such sessions uh, yes yeah, sir we can go with the question and answers parallelly hello yes sir yes yeah, sir we can go with the question and answers oh, uh, shall we start okay awesome yeah. um so the for the last question the latest question i have is when bias is needed to be evaluated after model building or before model building in an nlp process and as i discussed earlier it's both like it's, it's both uh, things right before you build your model you want to understand if your data set is biased or not and after you build your model you want to see if your model is biased or not right so we want to do in both ways so the next question is how bias is controlled in deep learning because we are using neural network models so in deep learning we use regularization techniques and you know, and you know drop out and normalization which try to um, have a little less overfitting things but we have adversarial networks which work on top of uh, on top of um, the language models while training to you know challenge the model uh, to predict better to work better Uh, we have not discussed it yet because it's a very uh, it's kind of a complex situation to understand and it takes a lot of time uh, uh, to you know explain and it's a bit nuanced in nature so yes we can do that and it, uh, and one of the processes is you know um, to use um the adversarial networks to it hmm right so in the gpt3 common words were these the most common used words for genders or the most common biased words if the latter how were they identified as biased okay so in this question i think uh, okay hey karan so uh, you are asking that how we identified uh, that um, these words are biased so the uh, um, the frequencies uh, uh, you saw in the slide was the co occurrences so for example if you get a word he so you will see surrounding to word he what kind of adjectives they were using so that's how we get the common words from the cpt not from uh, not from the text directly i hope that answers you so whether the same will be applicable in nlp so the same so if you are doing natural language generation the same will be applicable because again you have to make it mitigate the biases all right and if you are using if you are doing that before the data set uh, before in the data preparation uh, place then obviously yes and uh, even if after even in your um, feedback loop where you are actually monitoring your models there actually you can see the results and then also you can do a uh, compensation around that all right um okay um so Uh, so one of the questions is again what is a concept subclass so i'll explain again so looks weird but a concept so for example if you are talking about gender now gender is a concept and what subclass is is the access we want to identify so that we can add we can actually get an access perpendicular to it where we can actually project our word embeddings on that neutral axis which is perpendicular to the concept subclass slash gender axis so the gender axis is what a concept subclass is but because gender axis is a very crude way of saying in two dimensions subclass is a more linear algebraic way of saying um all right so i think that covers okay so uh, so one of the questions i want to test my ml program through sensors can i convert my python code workable in arduino um, so I'm, i'm sorry i cannot comment on that because i really don't work now on arduino when i when i did it was mostly prototyping on the hardware directly i haven't really worked with python on it so i'm sorry i cannot answer question on that so yeah uh, i think we covered everything here guys and if 
you found value in it i hope you found value in it and it's a probably it's a direction in which you can actually think about it and it's a good direction to do research on your research too so um thank you so much uh, the moderators ram goswami and the analytics with their handle to you know giving me an opportunity to speak in front of a lot of people actually and uh, yeah had a had a really fun time here thanks thanks a lot sir thanks a lot the session was yeah, really i could great. not i could not actually start my video because it was uh, restricted but yeah um thank you so much for having me i'll drop off then that's fine sir uh, thanks a lot sir the session was really great and on behalf of analytics with ya i like i thank you for your time and for delivering such a great session and also all the best for your uh, research in graphical neural models sir awesome. and thank you so much sir. i'll see you then have a great day have a great have a great evening guys in india and in the us and eu regions have a great day ahead thank you yes sir sir if you may can i share your linkedin profile for the audience ah uh, sure you can do that yeah So if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm available. Or uh, you want to discuss some problems you have, you want to understand how you can transition into data science. Uh, we can, you know, we can discuss, and you know, I can help you out in in any way possible. If you want referrals, I can do that too. So yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, everyone, everyone, I have shared the I have shared the LinkedIn profiles of Mr. Shantam in the chat section. Please refer to it, and I hope you guys have filled in the feedback poll. If you are, if not, please fill in the poll as it would help us to conduct more such sessions. And also, if you wish to conduct a webinar or facing any difficulty in registering, connect with us at editor at analyticswithya dot com. We'll share the mail ID shortly. And also, the recording of the video will be available in the YouTube in three to four days. And thanks, thank you all guys. We'll be back with you another session of the Data Hour on twenty fifth July. And for the upcoming sessions, the link will be shared from our fellow moderators. Thank you guys. Thank you. So we will wrap up.